بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله استعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من يهده الله فلا بد له ومن يضلل فلا هادي وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له عز وجل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم فصباه بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يداي الساعة من يتع الله والرسول فقد رشده وَمَنْ يَأْسِهِمَا فَإِنَّ لَا يَدُورُ إِلَى نَفْسَهُ وَلَا يَدُورُ لَهَا شَيْعًا أَمَّا بَعْدَ فقال الله تعالى في كتابه في السورة المائدة اليوم أقمعت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي وَعَدِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْكَرِيمِ وَنَفَعَنِي وَيَأْكُمْ بِالذِّكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ إِنَّهُ بِكُلِّ وَادِرٍ فَرَاحٍ الْحَيَّةُ I see refuge in Allah from Satan, from Shaitan, and curse the devil. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, all praises due to Allah. I seek his help and beg his forgiveness, and we seek refuge in Allah from the mischief and the evils of our souls. Whosoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray, and whosoever Allah finds in error, there is none to guide you. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity existing, and therefore worthy of worship, except Almighty Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth and all things in between. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's servant, apostle, and messenger. Oh, you who believe, whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, surely that person is rightly guided. And whosoever disobeys the two of them, surely that person harms only his or her own soul. And they harm not Allah the slightest little bit, the least little bit. As for what follows. For Allah, glory be to him, as said in the Quran, today I have perfected your religious way of life for you, completed my grace, completed my favor upon you, and chosen for you Islam as a religious way of life. And further, uh, there is a uh, hadith, uh, Sahih hadith, narrated by uh, Abu Juhaifa, in which he relates that uh, Salman, meaning Salman al Farsi, Salman the Persian, Salman the Iranian, said to a group of companions, it says, the Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, made a fellowship between Salman and Abu Darda. Salman visited Abu Darda and found his wife, Um Darda, dressed in worn out clothing. He asked her why she was like this. She said, your brother Abu Darda is not interested in this world. 
Then Abu Darja entered and prepared a meal for Salman. Salman asked Abu Darja to eat with him, but he said, I am fasting. Salman said, I will not eat until you eat. So Abu Darja ate with him. When the night arrived, Abu Darja. <laughs> When the night arrived, when the night arrived, Abu Darja stood for prayer, but Salman asked him to sleep. And Abu Darja slept. After a while, Abu Darja arose again, but Salman asked him to sleep. When it was the last hours of the night, Salman asked him to get up, and they both offered night prayers. Salman said to him, and here I just want to read in the Arabic, it says, Salman said to him, Inna li rabbika alayka haqqa, wa li nafsika alayka haqqa. Wali Aklika Aleka Hakan Fa Akti Kuli the Hakan Hakahu. It says, Salman said to him, You have a duty to your Lord. You have a duty to your body. And you have a duty to your family. So you should give each one its rights. Oh, you who worship Allah. The, the verse that I read from the Quran is one that we hear often quoted in Islam. Today I have perfected your religious way of life for you, completed my grace, my favor upon you, and approved Islam as a religious way of life for you. We hear this often. The scholars of the Quran, the Mufassirun, uh, the scholarly commentators of the Quran, have said that even though we find this particular verse in the fifth surah of the Quran, in, in, a, in the third uh, verse, that it was in fact the last verse of the Quran revealed to Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. As a matter of fact, the Prophet passed away just a matter of days after the revelation of this particular ayah. And I want to point out a couple of things because it is this verse from the word of Allah, as well as the hadith that I just read, that provide the context for what we're going to reflect upon today. First thing I want to point out about this verse is that, you know, sometimes when I'm uh, reading from the Quran, I'll, you know, I always read the Arabic so we hear what Allah has said. And then sometimes, and then I always read the English translation of what Allah has said. And sometimes I am using a given popular translation of the Quran. Sometimes, you know, it's use of Ali, it's this, it's that. Today I'm using this particular one uh, by uh, Muhammad. Uh, Farooq al-Azam Malik, may Allah reward him for his work. But then sometimes also as I'm translating, I'm looking at the Arabic and I'm translating myself what Allah has said. And I'm doing it or striving to do it in a way that will reach our minds, our psyches as English speaking people. So in most of the translations of the Quran, 
uh, when you see this phrase, Aryama Akmautu Lakum Deen Lakum, Wa Atmamtu Wa Raditu Lakumul Islam Dina. Usually, most translations of the Quran, they translate that. Today I have perfected your religion for you, completed my grace of favor upon you, and chosen for you Islam as a religion. That's how most of the English translations of the Quran translate the word deen as religion. I didn't do that. I translated it as religious way of life. And I did that purposely in order to remind us that the word deen, deen from Dana Yadino, deen means, it doesn't just mean uh, one's belief. You know, religion in terms of what you believe. But rather, the word deen means the way that you live based upon what you believe. That's what the word deen means the way that we live based upon what we believe. Christians have a deen. Jews have a deen. Polytheists have a deen. Muslims have a deen. A way of life that is incumbent upon us based upon what we believe. Now, of course, we know that some people believe one thing and do something else. I mean, we, we know that. The deen of Islam demands, for instance, that the Muslims lead a clean, sober life. Deen of Islam demands that because intoxicants are forbidden in Islam. Even wine. Jews have kosher wine. Christians take communion with wine. No such thing as halal wine. And so if the Muslim drinks wine, much less cocaine, weed, reefer, etc., 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 then he or she has stepped outside of the lifestyle of the Muslim according to what we believe because Allah tells us that those things are forbidden. So when we hear that the last verse of the Quran was one in which Almighty God, in which Allah speaking on the tongue of the prophet, peace be upon him, says, this day I have perfected your deen for you, meaning, O oh Muslims, we must hear, this day I have perfected your religious way of life for you. And so as Muslims, and further, and chosen, Islam as a religious way of life. So as Muslims, we must be concerned not only with what we believe or what we say we believe, but with the way that we live our lives based upon that particular set of beliefs that is called Al-Islam. O oh, you who worship Allah. And I point this out because of what I want to talk about today. Because generally, when we hear Dinal Islam, are we going to talk about the Deen of Islam? We expect to reflect upon or talk about prayer fasting, uh, uh, zakah or sadaqah, you know, the charity, hajj. That's what we expect to talk about when we um, hear the word deen. But 
I quoted the statement of Salman, and I'm sorry, when I was reading it, uh, I neglected to read the very end of it. It says, after Salman made this statement to his friend Abu Darda, you have a duty to your Lord, you have a duty to your body, and you have a duty to your family, so you should give each one its rights, he said. Hadith ends and says, Abu Darda went to the Prophet, meaning Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and told him what Salman had said. And the Messenger of Allah, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Salman is correct, he said. O oh, you who worship Allah. So I, I want to invite you today to reflect on this hadith, on this prophetic narrative. And our three levels of duty, our three levels of obligation that are incumbent upon us in this religious way of life that we claim. The first one is the one, of course, that uh, you expect when Salman said, he said, you have a duty to your Lord, he said. You have a duty to your obligation, and I don't think that needs a great deal of elaboration. Here's a verse from the Quran, Allah says, um, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ هُنَفَى وَيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَيُقْتُوا الزَّكَاةِ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيَّمَى Allah says, Yet, you are commanded nothing but to worship Allah with their sincere devotion to Him, being true in faith to establish prayers, pay the obligatory charity, and that is the infallible true religion. So when we are told you have a duty to your Lord, that duty is worship. And for those of us in the Abrahamic family, we understand that the duty to worship is a duty to monotheistic worship, a duty to the worship of the one God. Again, in the hadith, the word being translated duty, haqqan, you, you kept, when I was reciting in Arabic, you kept hearing the word alay kal haqq. Yeah, translated duty, obligation. Also means truth. You have a truth, the reality, and, uh, uh, and Allah says of uh, himself in the Quran, uh, huwa al-haq, Allah is the truth and the reality. Almighty God is the truth and the reality. And his existence is the truth, it's not a theory or a theorem. It's not theoretical. The existence of Allah is the truth and Allah it's the truth and the reality. So one of Allah's most beautiful names, one of the 99 names of Allah is Al-Haq, the truth and the reality. But what I want to invite us today to do is to reflect on Dean beyond, beyond a religious way of life centered on a narrow understanding of worship. Because yes, uh, prayer is worship, charity is worship, fasting is worship, sacred pilgrimage is worship, but that's not all there is to worship. That's not all there is. There is more. And Salman was reminding uh, Abu Darda of that 
when he said to him, not only did he remind him, you have a, a duty to your Lord. And he said that because they were, you know, it was the middle of the night, they were getting up praying. But then he said to him, he said, you have a duty to your body. You have an obligation to your body, he said to him. So part of good religion, hear what I'm saying? This is serious. Part of good religion, good religious way of life is giving your body its rights. Part of good religion is taking care of your health. Part of good religion is acknowledging and respecting the rights that are due to the body that Allah has loaned us. Your body is just on loan. It's just on a loan. And Allah loans every human being a body for different periods of time. Some of us have a body on loan just as a matter of minutes or a matter of hours. Some of us have a body on loan for many years. Uh, a few weeks ago, one of our brothers, good brother, Brother Daoud, you see him a lot of times on the desk when you come in. He invited me to his uh, mother's uh, 99th birthday party. Mother 99. And uh, I went, I was glad to go, glad to attend. And when I was there, I'm sitting in a quiet moment, and I thought about another elder who had passed away, and she was 104. She outlived her daughter, her, her daughter, who was the mother of one of the sisters, passed away at I think it was 84 or 85, which is a good life. But her mother outlived, meaning the grandmother of the sister, outlived her mother by almost 20 years. In fact, uh, she was 104, and I think she passed away a couple of weeks short of her 105th birthday. So the body that Allah gave her was on loan for a good while. But your body is just alone. It's a trust. When Allah decrees that the individual soul and spirit and consciousness that is you and I will come into the life of this world because the world, the dunya, is a material world. Allah gives our souls a material body to move around hayat dunya to move around in the life of this world. But then when our time is up, and nobody knows when that time will be up except for Allah. But when our time is up, the soul goes back where it came from, and the body goes back where it came from. Where did the soul come from? Allah teaches us in the Quran when someone passes away, we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Surely we come from Allah and we go back to him. Where does the body, does the body go back to Allah? No. The body goes back into the earth. Why? Because it was created from the earth. If you do a chemical analysis of the physical you, Everything is there, elements that come from the earth. The iron, the phosphorus, the sulfur, the carbon, those are all elements that are found in the earth. The soul goes back to Allah, and the body, when it's uh, time for loan is up, it goes back to the earth too. I mean, even those people, I was thinking the other day, even those people who take physical remains and cremate them, now we don't do that. But even when you cremate remains, they still go back to the basic elements. 
Then they'll take those elements and put it in a jar. And so it's the same thing. The body is on loan. And Allah places on us an obligation to care for that which he has loaned us. So I cite this, dear brothers and sisters, in order to remind you and remind myself that good religion is taking care of your health. Good religion is not only being Muslims, clean and sober, but it is also cultivating good health for yourself and practicing good health as a way of life. And I don't know if we're looking at religion that way. And I cite this because I reflect upon my own health. You know, I'm not the youngster I was when I first started giving kutbahs in this masjid. The first time I gave a kutbah here at MIB, I think I was 23 or 24 years old. And I've been giving kutbahs ever since. I'm 67. But when I was giving kutbahs in my 20s and in my 30s, I was, you know, young, at the peak of health, working out, you know, MIB style, you know, working out according to the, listen now, working out according to the tradition of Muslim men amongst African-American Muslims. African-American Muslims, we have a tradition. What is it? It is the practice of martial arts, man. There are other Muslims in other parts of the world that, that do that, you know, as well. Muslims in Indonesia practice martial arts. Muslims in China practice martial arts. Well, African-American Muslims up until recently, our standard of deen was men were in shape. You couldn't just be walking around here, you young, and you walking around with a <coughs> fat stomach and all that kind of thing that you haven't even earned. <laughs> you ain't even earned that stomach, man. You wait until you get over 60 and your metabolism starts slowing down and stuff. Maybe then you can get a little gut. <laughs> you know? But before then, no, you don't deserve one. Again, uh, I was reading an exchange between uh, one of the companions, I forget which one it was, and he met one of the other Sahaba, they gave each other the Sanabs, and that Sahaba had like a big stomach. And so this companion looked at him, he said, man, yo, man, what's that? And the brother said, this is the blessing of Allah, he said. And the companion looked at him and said, no, actually, it's the curse of Allah, he said. Being overweight from overeating is Allah's punishment. Why? Because you're violating the law, the rights of the body. When you don't give your body proper nutrition, when you don't give your body proper rest, when you put toxins into your body, to intoxicate is to poison. A toxin is a poison. And toxins come in all different forms, liquid toxins, powder toxins. You know, it's they, they, they have a, a problem in the society right now that they're calling an opioid crisis. When the opioid crisis was in the black and brown community, you know, black Americans and Latinos, when the opioid crisis was in uh, our community, it was called a public health menace. And the solution was to incarcerate people by the hundreds of thousands. Now that the opioid crisis is in the white American community, and that's where it is, uh, you know, now that it's in that community, uh, community, the call is for, get this, quote unquote, 
compassionate care. And the solution to the problem is positive as treatment. Nobody locking them up. No prison industrial complex with a demographic rooted in that community. In fact, they're teaching now. It's, it's so bad, the crisis is so bad, they're teaching people, I know I took the course uh, two weeks ago, uh, what to do if somebody has an OD in front of you. They're giving out kits, they call them naloxone kits. And I have one, I carry it in my briefcase now. And they say, you know, if a person falls out from an OD, reach in your kit, do this, do that. Oh my God. But this is a, an awareness that we must have as Muslims in order to practice good religion. Sobriety is good religion. The militi islami, which is the Muslim equivalent of uh, Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, that's a life-saving religious activity. One of our young men went overseas to study years ago. And before he uh, went overseas, he was critical of military Islam. Ah, man, brothers imitating the Kufa, and, you know, meeting in the mosque and stuff a lot. You know, that was his attitude. So he went overseas to study, and he was sitting with one of the sheikhs over there, scholars. And he asked him if military islami was uh, legal, you know, if it was permissible. So, of course, this scholar in this Muslim country overseas had never heard of. He said, what is it? He said, well, it's like NA and AA. He said, what is that? So the brother explained what it was, and the sheikh said, just a minute, let me get this straight. You're telling me that there are Muslims who've been addicted to drugs and alcohol, right? He said, yes. He said, and they're coming together in recovery from addiction for the purpose of reinforcing each other's sobriety. He said, yes. He said, where did they meet? He said, they meet in the masjid. And so the sheikh looked at him and said, so they're going from being disobedient to Allah to obeying Allah and getting with other people who are trying to obey Allah. And you're asking me if that's permissible in Islam? The brother called back here from overseas and said to me, Imam, please apologize to the brothers and sisters for me and tell them my sheikh said this is a blessed activity, O oh, you who worship Allah. So uh, uh, I think you get the point. Take care of your health. I have a team of brothers and sisters who work with me here in the mosque. We go to visit the sick. And you know what? Hospitals are full of sick Muslims. And they're sick from the same diseases that everybody else is sick from. The Muslims suffering from diet-related illnesses. Muslims with diabetes. Muslims with uh, uh, heart trouble. Muslims with cancer. Muslims with hep C, all kind of things. And one day I was coming out of the hospital and looking at my appointments, you know, man, I got to go to the doctor tomorrow. And I said to myself, if we are really living this way of life, if we're eating the way that we're supposed to eat, if we're giving our body its rights, then why are we suffering the same way that other people are? And then it occurred to me, we're not being dutiful in guarding our health 
give your body its rights, Salman said. So reflect upon this, dear brothers and sisters, and see taking care of your health as a sign of righteousness. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa tuba. I think the death, um, well, brother, look right behind the flag there, the, uh, the uh, fuse boxes there. And flip those fuses until you find the one that clicked off and, and uh, click it back on. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم بارك وسلم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد عليه السلام والسلام وعلى آله وصحبه وصاره أجمعين برحمتك يا أحب الرحمين وبعد. for dear brothers and sisters, let me conclude. Uh, today's khutbah by reminding us again of the statement of Salman when he said um, لِرَبِّكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقًّا وَلِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقًّا وَلِأَقْلِكَ أَقْلِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقًّا he says to your Lord is the right to, and, and by the way, I, I read the translation uh, to your body, but actually in Arabic, it says linafsika. It says to your soul, to your individual soul. Your individual soul, your individual right has, uh, your individual spirit has a right over you. It, it doesn't operate by itself. It does what you tell it to do. So if you command your soul to pray and to fast and to act righteously, your soul will do that. If you command your soul to obey Allah, Allah says, I've completed for you Islam as your deen. What is Islam? Submission to Almighty God. Submission. If you command your soul to submit, your soul will submit. And on the day of judgment, when your soul has to stand before Allah, to be judged, it will say, well, this person here who you loaned me to, he or she really took good care of me. He or she encouraged me to obedience and submission. Or your soul will snitch on you and say, well, you gave me, you know, you put me in the trust of this guy here. Uh, you put me in the trust of this girl here, and man, they abused me. They would not feed me through prayer. They chained me through the earth by to the earth by being stingy. <coughs> they starved me because they never fasted. They, you know, it'll be snitching. So don't blame me, Allah. Punish him. Give me some mercy. Punish her. Give her some mercy. I was only doing what he or she told me to do. And then lastly, so so again, give your soul this rights, man. Don't be neglecting yourself. I know we just finished a month of fasting. Those of us who had the health to fast, alhamdulillah, don't go back to neglecting yourself now. Don't go back to, you know, you're not going to fast anymore until next year this time. What kind of health would you be in if you only ate one month out of the year? If, you're, if you took one month and you ate abundantly, 
But then the other 11 months, you didn't eat anything, what kind of health would you be in? Well, that's the kind of spiritual health you'll be in if you only fast one month out of the year and then neglect your soul the other month. So lastly, uh, Salman said, you have a duty to your family to give your family its rights. Your family is, the, what is the right of the family? Muslim. Muslim men, I'm going to talk specifically to you, to us. What is the right that our family has over us? Our family has a right to be protected by us. Our family has a right to be maintained by us. We're supposed to be taking care of them, not them taking care of, of, of us. You're supposed to take care of your wife. Your wife's not supposed to take care of you. When, you, when it's come time to pay the zakah, you're supposed to be paying for every uh, dependent in your family, not them paying for you. And that's their right. The family has a right to love and compassion from you as the father. The mothers are compassionate and loving, you know, reflexively. But you're a man, you got a wife, you got children, you should be compassionate and loving to them, and they, as well as being stern. <laughs> as well as being stern. Yeah, you're supposed to be bold. I, I quoted that hadith to you before. When a man with a frown on his face said to, looked at the prophet, the prophet was picking up children, kissing them, you know, throwing them up in the air. And then he looked over, here's a guy standing there. The prophet said, what's wrong with you, man? man said, I got a whole bunch of children. And I don't play with them, kiss on them, and carry on like that. The prophet said, he who is not merciful and compassionate will not be shown mercy and compassion. He said to him, meaning by Allah. Huh? So they have a right to all of these things. And they have a right to our time and, and, and our maintenance of ourselves. And that's what I'm going to end on. Your family has a right to your time. You should not be so busy, you know, being a man. You know how we are. We're busy trying to do the right thing, hopefully. You can't be working all the time and neglect your family. Well, I'm working for my family. Ah, oh, man, please. Give your family some time. Some of you. I'm out fisa bilillah. Yeah, okay, good. Be out fisa bilillah. But give your family some time. You going to serve God? Cool. But serve your family. That's why Allah put your family in your trust. Give them some time. Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, he used to divide according to the authenticated biographies. He would divide his days, a complete day, what we call 24-hour cycle, into thirds. He would spend one third attending to the needs of the ummah, of the community, doing things on behalf of the people. He would spend one third attending to the needs of his family. Up, oh, yeah, no, I gotta go uh, spending time with my family. Once he was at home and the believers were imposing on his time, Allah sent an ayah to tell the believers, get out the prophet's house, man. He too polite to look at Surah 49 right at the beginning of the ayah. You know, they imposing on his time as if him being the messenger of Allah did, didn't mean that he was entitled to some privacy, man, to some downtime. So Allah revealed the ayah and told the believers, man, get out of the prophet's house. <laughs> because he loved his people, so he would give up his time to them. And then the last third, he would divide it in half. One sixth, he would rest, lay down, get a little sleep. Then he would get up from out of his sleep and worship 
in prayer for the rest of the night. That's the real Superman right there. You don't believe it? Try it. Try it. Your family has a right over you. And your families, amongst your family's rights is that you will take care of your health. So that you don't, you know, neglect yourself and then your family get left without a father. Your family get left, you know, without a husband. Not because it's just your time, you know what I mean, but because you're neglecting yourself. Don't neglect yourself. Take care of yourself. This has been a reminder to you and a reminder to myself. That's why every uh, once or twice a year, we have the table, like there's a table downstairs, we're giving out health literature. We ask you to sign our uh, mailing list uh, because we're trying to start up a health ministry here. Today, it's HIV and help see material down there. Another time you're going to come in, it's going to be cancer material. Another time you're going to come in and it's going to be, I don't know, something else. Asthma. I'm looking at you. Most of you from the black and brown communities of New York. Most of you, African Americans, uh, your Latinos, you're from the African continent, you're from the Arab world, people of color. Don't you know we have the worst health demographics in America now? The worst numbers in every health category are in the community that you and I come from. The ones who will be most affected by uh, Donald the Joker Trump's presidency and his desire to, to slash Medicare, slash Medicaid, you know, force, uh, force people to bow to the insurance companies, doing away with Obamacare. The people who will be affected most by that are you and I. So we must take seriously our obligation to ourselves, practice good health. And the best health is preventive health. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, ameen wa alqa ikaa.